safe challenges they are uh, uh, given right now. What is impressive as well is the uh, reinforcement learning and application of reinforcement learning uh, to uh, game playing. Uh, Dota 2 is one of the game. Uh, the company which is behind uh, this uh, research is OpenAI in that case. And you can see there uh, top five top human players uh, and uh, five uh, artificial intelligence players. What you can see there uh, is an age and AI. And the age are humans. And this is the, uh, what is quite interesting on that, that everything from scratch was trained just by using the training neural networks or in particular reinforcement uh, learning algorithms to learn the behavior and to compete with people. Uh, the reward for that is more than 11 million of dollars, so there is a strong motivation uh, for anyone uh, to win. And in April uh, 2019, the neural network won 99.4% uh, in all the uh, games that uh, it played, and it's still getting to be uh, improving. What is quite in, in, uh, interesting that for the training was used 10,000 of CPUs and 1,000 of the GPU, uh, GPUs uh, for the training and a simulated time uh, that, were, that was used for the training was about uh, 45 years. What you will see on the next slide is uh, that there will be a human player. The human player together with AI player as and what you can notice is that the human player will try to hide in the trees to get some advantage. You can see that AI players will notice that and will uh, lose interest uh, to fighting with the close one, human player, and they will try to find uh, the uh, human player hidden in the forest. So uh, let's take a look on that game. Right now, they are he was just hidden, so they are trying to uh, search for him and to, to get rid of his uh, advantage to be hidden in that place. And what is impressive of that is that everything from scratch was learned by just by self-playing the games and uh, playing a computer uh, with a computer. A similar uh, work uh, was related to DeepMind with uh, their FSTAR algorithms and playing StarCraft uh, algorithms. In that case, I just don't know why it is not playing. Well, unfortunately. Hmm. Unfortunately, no video for that. Uh, however, this is another one. Uh, case when a really complex strategy game uh, was uh, trained by neural networks and uh, beat it 99.8% uh, uh, of all the human players and it was said that we can pass, uh, we uh, passed the Turing test uh, on a StarCraft game. So the deep learning and all the stuff related to deep learning are uh, evolving really rapidly. But what is the future of AI and how does it compare to the human brain? Is it the same basis of the human brain or not? Well, how it works usually with the uh, data is that we are getting vectors, we are getting arrays, we are getting matrices. Uh, in general, uh, all of them are being called uh, tensors. They are then being processed and again we are getting a vector, array, matrix or tensor uh, on its input. However, they are not just only uh, tensor data. They are as well uh, graph data, they are as well uh, tree uh, data structures, for example text. Uh, in the case of uh, graph, uh, the, all of us are uh, internally representing uh, the world uh, using a graphs in our uh, memory. So how we usually do and work uh, with vectors is that we are using so-called embeddings and we are encoding uh, graphs and trees uh, into the vectors and then uh, we are processing them. Unfortunately, it means that we are losing uh, information. 
Uh, in case, for example, next uh, we are using embeddings like Elmo uh, in graphs, uh, we are using, uh, for example, some kind of uh, renewable approaches for this purpose. However, how do we perceive the world? In case, uh, well, uh, this is coming from the theory of psychologists. Uh, human internal model seems like a graph. For example, uh, let's say uh, we are talking about the image that is written here. Uh, there is a, uh, some cylinders, uh, some uh, sphere, uh, some cube. And uh, the human internal model and how we store it in our memory is uh, that we have uh, some, uh, let's say, uh, vertices. The vertices have some relations. Uh, the relations have some attributes and uh, using that uh, we are coding that using uh, multigraphs, uh, extended multigraphs uh, with some uh, extended uh, features and descriptions of the relationships. What we can do as a human as well, for example during our sleep, is uh, to do abstractions. The abstractions means uh, that we generalize the knowledge uh, and by the way, we are much, much better in generalization when compared to current state-of-the-art uh, algorithms. And uh, for example, we can say that all the metal objects uh, are large when we uh, take a look uh, at the figure. Uh, so how the problem solving can be generalized is that we are getting any knowledge. Any knowledge is, it means a graph. When after processing that, we are taking our current uh, experience and using the current experience, uh, we are applying that and uh, we are creating a solution and solution, uh, as it is again uh, some uh, idea, it means it is uh, some uh, another graph. How we do, we can do that is that we have so-called combinatorial uh, generalization. Uh, which is being developed in our, in our prefrontal uh, context. And uh, not much of current AI is able to do that, and definitely it is not able to do that in a such a way as uh, human uh, beings, as a, uh, let's say, let's say, uh, artificial general intelligence should do that. Uh, the motivation of how to, why to achieve AGI is really strong. There are definitely risks uh, coming from uh, artificial intelligence. Anyway, in case we will be able to achieve artificial general intelligence to reach uh, artificial super intelligence is uh, not so a big problem. Uh, it is expected it will be much more easier than to uh, reach uh, the part of artificial uh, general intelligence and uh, we can uh, overcome significantly the scale of that. What we know right now and we can understand is the uh, understanding of brain. Uh, a couple of years ago we were involved in a research uh, how to analyze that uh, from the point of view of uh, image analysis and how to understand uh, the parts uh, of the brain and how to reconstruct the, bra the brain. Uh, there are as well uh, already some models of the human brain uh, that was uh, scanned and uh, simulated uh, by IBM company. Anyway, no any uh, reproduction was ever able to uh, do uh, that in a such a way that uh, there were uh, self consciousness uh, about the realization and uh, independent uh, thinking so far. And uh, regarding to that, all the approaches, uh, approaches uh, so far has failed. What is really interesting about this that our brain and as well the Bird's brain evolved uh, three hundreds, more than three hundreds million of years uh, of separate evolution. We uh, both are coming from a relatively simple brain, uh, really small neocortex, really uh, uh, simple neocortex. Uh, this neocortex didn't have any capability of uh, uh, combinatorial generalization. Uh, however, what is really impressive and uh, really uh, interesting is that the wiring of the brain, of the human brain, is quite similar to the uh, wiring of the brain of birds. And uh, in our brain, there are parts that are 
related and similar to reinforcement learning. Uh, there are as well areas that are uh, modeling uh, self-awareness. There are uh, parts that uh, are used for memory, automated uh, uh, motor skills, and so on. And if I will be able to run it, unfortunately, video. Uh, what was in the video is uh, that birds can do uh, the combinatory generalization and uh, how they can solve the problems. And unfortunately, there are some issues that I am not able to run it right, uh, right away. So, what's the difference between the human brain and AI is uh, the efficiency of the human brain is uh, really impressive. It uh, consumes only 20 watts, it's a million times more effective uh, than the current state-of-the-art uh, computers. It can uh, store approximately 100 terabytes of memory in a really small uh, place. And the size of that is as well a million times uh, smaller than that. When we compare the human brain, uh, for example, the games that are able to uh, play the game, we are able to take you for your hand. Uh, okay, so I would like to thank Professor Larry once again for this additional talk. Now, let me tell you that his keynote actual talk is... I think, excuse me, Professor Dhanda, why don't you use that podium? Next speaker can talk from that podium. So it's my responsibility to thank Professor Larry Margaret. His keynote address is tomorrow in this hall at, uh, uh, in the first half. It is on my request, he, I requested him to introduce artificial intelligence in general to all the, you know, all the participants, just to set the theme of the conference. His actual keynote starts tomorrow. On my personal request, he had given you, you know, overview, and I, this was very interesting. I have personally said, thank you, Professor Reddy Market, for your additional effort, and uh, you have been a very, very responsible conference on uh, that. We look forward to talk to you Thank you so much. So the first keynote, first the first keynote talk of this IC3A will be delivered by Professor Caesar Alopi, who has been a good fan of mine. And uh, can we have a good round of applause for him? Because he is a
So uh, I, I would like to uh, introduce Professor, the speaker, the next keynote speaker. Professor Cesar Alapi is a professor of Politecnico di Milano in Italy, and um, also he is associated with University della Svizzera Italiana in Switzerland. Currently, he is also a visiting professor at the University of Kobe, Japan, and the University of Guangzhou in China. Now, he has been a visiting researcher at the UCL United Kingdom, MIT, United States, ESPI in KCR, RC, and many other organizations. Professor Alapi is a IEEE fellow, a member of the administration of the committee of the IEEE Computational Intelligence Society, Board of Governors, member of the International Neural Network Society, Board of, Board of Directors of the member of the European Intelligence Society, a past associate editor in the IEEE Transactions <coughs> of Emerging <coughs> Topics in Computational Intelligence, the IEEE Computational Intelligence Magazine, the IEEE Transactions on Instrumentation and Measurements, the IEEE, the IEEE Computational Intelligence of the Magazine Award in 2016, the Gabor Award, the Gabor Award from the Society of Outstanding Transactions of Neural Network and Learning by Systems. <laughs> and uh, overall, overall, his contribution in the area of artificial intelligence and machine learning has been widely across the world recognized. Uh, welcome to the next keynote. Actually, this is the first keynote speaker. So, Professor Elabi, over to you. Good afternoon to everybody and uh, Namaste, or Namaskar, and Namaste to So it is a really great pleasure to be in uh, this uh, really very well known uh, university and have the opportunity to spend some time with you today. Uh, thank you to Professor Data. As I said, we are very good uh, friends. And uh, yeah, here we are. And also thank you to the previous speaker because uh, he nicely introduced the basics, uh, where we are going to. So what I'm presenting today is uh, some of uh, the very advanced topics in machine learning, which uh, I think that can be of benefit to most of us. Uh, deep machine learning, everybody knows that. Uh, the key point is uh, how to process unstructured data. As uh, we have uh, seen from the previous uh, presentation, it is uh, very common to deal with the graphs. And then I will show you some examples. Why are graphs interesting? Because uh, we are common in traditional engineering to deal with uh, vectors, uh, matrices, tensors, and then uh, we like very much the use of uh, some traditional techniques for evaluating distances and uh, figures so very. However, if we look at the reality, we will see that it is very common to have a graph representation. And uh, since they are very complex because of the uh, structure, nature they have, we would like very much to do a mapping, a transformation from a graph space into some vector, matrix, tensor space, where we have all the tools. And then from there, it would be very nice to be able to go back to the space of graphs. Uh, so this is my presentation. I will say why we need the graphs, how we can move from a graph space to a tensor space, a vectorial space where we have the concept of distance. And, uh, and uh, as, a, uh, as an application, which is a clean application, I will uh, show you how to detect anomalies within these structures or changes in stationarity. Uh, for the younger students, 
I, I just want to recall and uh, to keep in mind that every time you build a classifier, you build a predictor, you build a regression method with a neural nest or whatever, you are implicitly assuming that your data are identically and independent and identically distributed. That is a major assumption, which is not really met in real applications. So uh, the tech changes in stationarity means that something is going on and you should pay attention in the data streams you are receiving. So why graphs? Well, because uh, in many applications, gra graphs come naturally. So drugs are designed. We want to build and we are at the design a deep neural networks that receive molecules, drugs, and they are able to generate, as we saw in the previous uh, presentation, the generated adversarial learning mechanism that we can regenerate new molecules, not new faces or fake, fake faces. We are interested in new drugs, new medicines. Uh, so we have drugs. Uh, so we have nose, oxygen, hydrogen, carbonium. And then if we move to our new, uh, neural networks in our brain, graphs are there, naturally. If uh, we go to cyber physical systems, to the Internet of Things, we see that graphs come naturally again. Uh, this is an example of a real application. It is a city in uh, Switzerland. It is a sub-area of that city. And uh, there, what you see as uh, points, spots, red and green, are smart meters. Are those sensors that you have in your, your homes that measure the power consumption over the time, over the day? Uh, for instance, if uh, we look at uh, here, we have uh, the first uh, power load signal, how much uh, power we do consume over time. This is for a different user, for a different user, and so on. If uh, we look at the structure, we see that uh, the concept of graph is already there. So we have uh, physical connections. And we have also some points. Each of these uh, smart meters is uh, generating a signal. Now, if we look at those uh, signals, let's try to take uh, windows out of them. So we take, I'm the first uh, user by home, I take uh, the first uh, window, then I look at, uh, I, I look at uh, my friend, the second uh, house, I take another window. What do we have? Uh, we are cutting all the signals coming from the field in a one time window, let's say one day, and now we can build the dependencies, Pearson coefficient, Granger causality, uh, autoregressive models. So what we have is that each signal become, becomes one node of the graph to which are associated some properties, and the dependencies between data streams are modeled as a features information associated to the edges of my graph. So, for instance, if we should take two nodes of the outcoming graph, what we have is that for one node, one home, we might decide to put the signal, load the signal, uh, the temperature outside the temperature, the day and time, weekday, holidays, we consume differently if it is a Saturday or if it is Monday, the number of inhabitants within the house, which relates to the power consumption, uh, the average wealth of the family, how much we do earn over, over time. And uh, the same for each node, and then edge attributes, signal correlation, that is one of the features, weather correlation, uh, cable length, whatever you can put in. This is just an example of a cyber physical system, but you can extend that to any problem where you have sensors generating data streams of any type, they can be videos, and there are dependencies. The key point with the graphs is that we do know explicitly that among some couples of sensors, there are dependencies. If you, we know that in advance, we want to take advantage out of that information. In that way, the inference engine will be much more effective. We, if uh, we take this uh, approach, we generate for one time slice, one window, one graph. If uh, we do that every day, for instance, we generate a data stream, so which is what we have there in the bottom. 
having a data stream, we can build all, all the techniques that we wish. So we can build the predictors, starting from graphs. We can do classification to see whether there are some anomalies or partition the classes into different classes, the signals we have. We can do any process. But now the information that we get is very strong. It's signal, signals, images, and uh, dependencies. Other examples are those coming from uh, social networks, Twitter, Facebook, whatever you want, even when we do exchange emails. We are sensors, we are virtual sensors, and uh, we build the subgroups, graphs, naturally, which can change with time. So I'm a, a friend of Khan, I'm a friend of Israel, I'm a friend of Professor Data, and so on. And so we are virtual nodes, we do exchange information. Information is what we do associate it with the dependence. Then we have a graph. We do, we have a, a graph, you know, we take uh, information for one day, we do that for the next day is another graph, and then the interest is to try to understand what's going on in the data streams, which are now graphs. Other applications, again, is a, this is a physical systems, uh, EEG, you have your sensor on a skull or inside the brain, there are electrons that go deep in there. And uh, clearly, if you look at the signals coming out, you have something that you are unable to see what's going on. However, what uh, we can do is to move from a signal representation, because we know there are dependencies, between sensors in graph representations. So what do we see here, for instance, we are looking for epilepsy. This is a research activity that uh, has, been, well, has been ongoing for, uh, for one year with a, a neuro center in Toronto, in Canada. Uh, the first graph is related to the normal activity of a brain, a human brain, and the second one is related to an epileptic crisis. Can I say it is an epileptic crisis? No way. If I take my graph, I change the orientation, it will be completely different. So, no meaning per se. However, what we can do is to start thinking not in terms of vectors, because we don't have vectors or matrices, but of these are structured data which are very rich in information content and we want to do processing. The very good news is that if we take graphs of any type of graphs you have in mind, clearly a tree is a very specific case, what we can do is uh, to build uh, a graph space where there is the concept of probability. We can define a sigma algebra. There is the concept of probability. And uh, from that space, we can define conceptually, mathematically, transformations, embedding, which uh, will allow you to evaluate the distances, the concept of a distance between two graphs in a graph space and uh, the distance into the embedded transformed space. So there are very strong results from the theory, which are going back to December 2016. So they are very, very recent. Before that, it was very difficult to use statistics on those structures. There are ways that will allow you to evaluate the distance between two graphs. Let's imagine that there is one graph. The tips of my fingers are the nodes and there are some dependencies. This is the second graph. I want to evaluate the distance, the affinity, the discrepancy between these two structures to look for similarity, for instance. And uh, clearly they come, I don't know how they come. So we need uh, to deal with the homomorphism problem. So conceptually, from the mathematical point of view, of view, we do all the possible permutations. We get close in this way, okay? And once they are changing, we evaluate from one space to an infinitely dimensional space. There we are able to play with topology and information content. 
Anyway, good news is that yes, we can define the concept of distances in the graph space. And uh, if we can do that, since uh, dealing with graphs is not that nice, we would like to do this uh, procedure. We have graph streams, they can be dependent, they can, can be independent, whatever. And uh, we would like very much to do an embedding, a transformation to a new space where we have vectors, matrices, tensors. And uh, once we have uh, some uh, tensor space, vectorial space, we can use either traditional techniques, signal processing techniques, or we can use neural networks if we want to do that. So, how do we do this embedding? In uh, the previous uh, uh, lecture, well, the professor pointed out a few techniques. I want to give you some, for students, some ideas of how we can map an object in the object space into something which is a vector space. And, uh, well, graphs and embedding spaces we basically change the way we look at things. We will see two approaches. The first one is a distance-based. We want to keep the concept of distance. If we have distances in the graph space, we want to keep the concept of distance in the embedded transform space. And then, since neural methods are so popular, can we do something with the neural networks? And we will see that it is not only that we can do that, it is, uh, it is uh, needed to do that, given the complexity of the problem. So let's start with a, a very simple techniques. So we start from a set of graphs, and we split them in two parts. The green ones that we call the training graphs, and the red ones that we do call prototypes. Randomly, you, know, you select them randomly from the graphs you, you generate. Now, in order to do the mapping from the graph space to a vector space, the easiest way is uh, to do what is called dissimilarity representation. You take uh, your graph, new graph, which is this one, and you do a conceptual projection on the first red graph. By doing the projection, the pointer, for some reason, is not working. By, by doing the projection, what we evaluate the distance between my current graph and the first prototype. This distance is a scalar number. Then, Again, we, I do a projection of my graph onto the second prototype and generate another number, another distance. And then you do that for all the red graphs. At the end of this procedure, you end up with a vector. That vector contains, in probability, the same information of the original space. If we select the distance in the proper way, as uh, Professor Jay described it in uh, his very relevant paper. The similarity representation is a highly nonlinear procedure, and that is why it is uh, very powerful. Let's imagine that there we have one manifold. It is with uh, three graphs. You see, each point is uh, is in a different color just to see the transformation. And now, what do we do? We do a projection on a big dimensional space, two prototypes. What you see is that the manifold, the structure of the space, is significantly modified. A different approach, which is called the multidimensional scaling, aims to do the following. It is based on a similarity representation. So again, we have the green graphs and the, red, the prototypes. We do a mapping into some space that is the hyperspace you see there. In the red points, we have the transformation of the prototypes. And now what we want to do is to do the mapping, the embedding, so that in the transform space, the concept of interdistances is maintained. So we want to maintain the metric structure 
in the transformation. If there are distances between my way of using Facebook and you, 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 so there are some distances, then in the transform space, I want those distances to be kept. That is the key point. So we maintain the same information content. Now, uh, the next stage is why should we use embeddings to a hyper plane. So that is what we do regularly. So we do embeddings and then we use Euclidean distances, we build the statistics and so on. However, given the graph of nature, which is very complex, the final space should not be a priori a hyper plane. We should not consider it as a distance, the Euclidean distance. The first extension is uh, to do embeddings in some Riemannian manifolds where we can control the curvature of the manifold. Uh, in this case, we have a hyperbolic manifold, then we have a flat manifold, and then we have a hyperspherical manifold. What does it mean? Is that I have my graph, I do a transformation in a space where in that space, the manifold is controllable. Why do I want to control the manifold? Because I want something that is non-linear, but at the same time, I want to build the concept of statistics in that manifold, to have the concept of distances between two points. What we know is that if this is, for instance, my manifold, it's like a hand, and I do a mapping. This is the transformation of my first graph. This is the transformation of first graph, second graph. The distance is not this distance. This distance is only if we assume that our space is Euclidean space. Otherwise, the distance is this one. I go down and I go up. Go up. I generate the concept of a geodesic, which is the distance between two points on some Riemannian manifolds. And that is what we have to do. And uh, if we do this exercise, we can repeat the methods of mapping on those manifolds. The good news is that we can show, the literature can show that we maintain the concept of a statistics, so we can build the concept of probability, so we can use all the techniques that we know. In doing a, in uh, doing this exercise, we are also, we can easily evaluate the distance between two points because of constant, many, uh, constant curvature manifold, we have the concept of geodesy, which comes from mathematics. So we have a formula which is telling me the distance between this point and this point. And all statistics is based on that, on all processing is based on that. Now, People come to me and say, why should I do a mapping between graphs to some manifold and then evaluating the distance to make decisions? Because what I do in the embedded space, I build statistics, I variance to variances, I make distances, and I say there is an anomaly, it is a different class, and so on. So, but there are neural networks, let's do a neural embedding. So I'm asking deep learning techniques to do the proper embedding from my graph into the proper transform space, the proper manifold. So I want to learn this mapping. The first key point we need to solve is how to represent the graph. Happily, even if the graph is unstructured, the mapping from a graph to a tensor is very simple. So we know that we can represent the graph through an adjacency matrix, which is describing the topology, the connectivity between a couple of nodes. We have a matrix X, which contains all the information associated with the node. If we have many of them, we build a tensor. E contains all the information associated with the edges. And if there are multiple, we have tensors. 
So basically, there are ways that allow us to represent graphs into tensors. If we have tensors, we can use TensorFlow, Torch, Keras, all the libraries that are freely available in the literature. How can we do this mapping? How can we deal with this mapping? Well, in the same way that we were able to generate new pictures of a cat, of a dog, as we saw before. So we want to consider some generative networks. Those generative networks start from autoencoders. An autoencoder is a very simple architecture. Uh, inside there is uh, some processing. It receives an object, a graph. It has to reconstruct the same object. So what you do, you have an unstructured information, some neural processing, and at the end, what you have is the same graph. As simple as that. So I present a microphone, I want a microphone. If I present a bottle, I want to reconstruct a bottle. And this mapping has to follow some processing rules. The key point of neural encoders is that in the middle, here, there is one vector. That vector is called the latent space. Conceptually, what we do, we map a graph to a vector. This is the goal of the encoder. And once we have the vector, starting from the vector, we want to do a transformation back the decoder, which brings us back to the world, to the space of graphs. These structures and these structures needed to be learned, so we need to do training, we need to learn them. But what is very good is that when the learning succeeds, it means that the information content associated with the vector coincides with information content associated with the graph. And it coincides because starting from this vector, we generate a new graph. So if we build an autoencoder to describe animals, and uh, this one was a cat, it was uh, generating something that is the compression of a cat, the concept of cat to a vector, if I slightly change these numbers randomly, I will generate a new cat that it doesn't exist. That is the generative part of the network. We play with that and the spaces and we go back to the real world. Now, since we are interested in doing embeddings, what do we do? We do this operation with graphs. We, once the training is complete, we cut this part, we take this vector and we do traditional processing. Very simple. There are some operations that need to be extended. The concept of convolution of graphs, concept of pooling, I'm not going into details, but we can extend, we can do fast Fourier transforms on graphs. Where we just look at the concept of vicinity, which depends on the dependency and not on the physical spatial vicinity. Now, what is good is that now we can, starting from a graph, to generate a compressed representation for further processing. What is bad is that we don't have control of the latent space. Which means that when we do the mapping, I don't know what is going on in that manifold. For sure it is a Riemannian manifold, but I don't know anything. So I cannot evaluate the distance between two vectors with a an Euclidean distance, because it is not a hybrid plane, and it is not a constant curvature manifold. So I cannot say that this point and this point are very close, so they are similar concepts, because the manifold can go down and come up, and this is the distance between these two points. So what we need to do now is to control the embedding, so that the embedding space the manifold follows the concept of probability and the concept of 
controllability with respect to the distances. This can be done with adversarial learning. Uh, for those of you who are familiar with adversarial learning, in adversarial learning we want to learn the behavior of my enemy. If a someone is carrying out a cyber attack and I can observe that, my goal is not only to understand that there is a cyber attack, but I would like to learn the behavior of the attacker. In that way, I can anticipate and the countermeasures because I know what he is going to do. Here, the idea is very similar. We have autoencoders which are doing my mapping. And what we want to do now is to have a data space, the vector space, that follows some properties. In this very interesting architecture, which is that proper of adversarial encoders, we have three elements that needs to be trained. The encoder, the decoder, and the discriminator. The encoder is doing its job, encoding a graph into a vector space and then from the vector space back to, to, the, to the graph. The discriminator is uh, introducing some property which is a known. In this case, this known property is the distribution of my points which has to be Gaussian. This is known, what I'm imposing. The discriminator now has to be able to discriminate between vectors, objects, instances coming from here or coming from here. Let's think of a, a Turing machine. This is the machine and this is, we are here. And what we want to be able is not to be able to discriminate between a machine and the humans. So we are building a machine here which is following the wish, desire, behavior. In this case, we want to impose on the transform manifold of the embedded space the Gaussian distribution. Adversarial learning goes through three stages. And it can be shown from the theory that in probability this procedure will converge to something that is meaningful. So let's think of a why. Okay, over time we repeat three steps. For each step we update parameters. We learn the encoder, the coder, we learn that stage. Then we update the discriminator. We want to train the discriminator so that the discriminator is able to say this point is coming from a graph, this point is coming from a Gaussian distribution. The third stage is now to fool the discriminator by training the encoder only so that the discriminator won't be any more able to discriminate between reality and data coming from a different planet. So in this case, Gaussian. It can be shown uh, that this procedure converges and the final impact of this min-max scale is that the value associated with the autoencoder later space, this one will follow this prime. So at the end of this procedure, these points, vectors, will follow a Gaussian distribution. If here I put a T-student, they will follow a T-student. And dimension, of course. And uh, clearly, what we can do now is not to request only the distribution, we want to have a manifold where I can do statistics, but we can also impose the structure of the manifold. With this architecture, I'm requesting the transformation to be on a hypersphere, the dimensional hypersphere, and the distribution has to be uniform. Adversarial learning, adversarial encoders allow you to introduce some constraints on your application. If you want to design a drug, a new drug, a new medicine, 
you want the physical properties to be maintained. And that is what does it mean to impose constraints. You don't want some drug that is not implementable. You want a drug that follows the physics and the chemistry. As a, an, an application, just to see how we can use uh, these techniques, for instance, is uh, how to detect changes in stationarity. So this problem is very simple. All graphs are equal, but some graphs are more equal than others. So there are some anomalies, and we want to detect anomalies. <coughs> Let's imagine that we have one random variable. If we have a one random variable, and that is the realization of that random variable over time, we say that, that there is a change in stationarity when the probability density function changes. Very simple. If it is a dynamical system, we talk about the time variance or invariance. If we look at there, there is a change in the stationarity at time tau equal to 100, but if we look at the data as they come, it's very difficult to detect the change. Where do we use these things? Oh, we build, we build the body networks, we are very smart in that. We want to build something to see the behavior of my heart. We have several sensors taking different information. We have graphs, graph three. We want to predict to detect it first if there are problems. And uh, what do we need to do in that case is to look for an anomaly that if a structural become changes in stationarity. You start from graphs, you have a my body network, you take a window so of an hour or a day, whatever you want, you build the graph by doing dependency gradual causality, and then you do the embedding, and you can use your favorite techniques. Clearly, if I want to build something which is saying something happened in my heart, so there is an anomaly, I want to say that in probability. I cannot just say, hey, you have a problem. You should say, you have a problem with a probability 0 0.96, which means that in your embedding, you are requesting the concept of statistics to hold, to be there. And at the same time, you want to be able to measure distances because you want to build the moments. So that is what we do with the chain detection test. Just to understand, we have graphs. In this case, we have a, a, a Gaussian distribution on a hypersphere. We have one point, a new graph, a new point, a new graph, a new point. By doing the, by using adversarial input encoders, if I look at these points over time, they build, the, they follow the concept of statistics. The, these points should be Gaussian distributed on a hypersphere. So what I can do is, uh, if I have points that do not follow that distribution with some confidence level, we have problems, so we detect the change. Not uh, even to mention that uh, performance are much better than any other performance you can think of. And a more complex uh, problem is that of uh, epilepsy detection, where in this case we have uh, 64 intracranial channels. Uh, as I said before, uh, to the left we have a normal function of my brain, to the right we have an epileptic seizure, there is an epileptic crisis. What we want to do is to detect at first that there is a crisis, which is fine, but then the next stage is to predict, to anticipate the crisis. And then finally, if we are able to build the model of the epileptic crisis, we can decide or define where to intervene. In this neurocentric in Toronto, they do lobotomy, physical lobotomy at the brain level. So they remove parts of the brain, which is that base pack associated with the generation of epilepsy. Clearly, you want to be well focused. Well, you do the very same procedure. 
you do the mapping on some these manifolds which are controllable in terms of shape and statistics. And finally, if you look at results, you see that you can get results which are amazing. They are in line with those of deep learning on a different field. Now, with graphs, you can use, as I said, application can come from any discipline where you have sensors and dependencies between sensors. So, uh, as a conclusion, machine learning based on graph processing is booming. When uh, we, you go to the airport in the most advanced uh, uh, airports, we do the AUs algorithms based on graphs to recognize you. Why? Because uh, we, we take uh, features associated with the eyes, the position of the eyes, the shape of the nose, the chin, and so on. And then we have uh, interdistances and the features which are associated with uh, uh, the age and so on. So we do that type of a matching between the prototypes in the database and you that uh, you are coming. And you do this matching and it is either you or not. So it is a graph uh, process. Graph embedding provides an effective mapping for further processing, which means that if you have graphs, there are ways that allow you to map into a manifold where you have a concept of statistics and you can evaluate the distances. You have a full control of that space. And then you can use your favorite technique. And we know that if we are there, that vector is fully representative. And starting from that vector, we are able to go back to the original space with a probability very high. That is controllable. We can control that. Adversarial learning and constant curvature manifolds are very effective approaches, so I warmly encourage you to consider them in your research fields. Clearly, uh, we didn't do all of this research by, by myself or not only within my, my group, uh, but this is my team in Switzerland and there is also Professor Lili from uh, Canada. And uh, the good news is that as we have TensorFlow, Keras, PyTorch for dealing with the tensors, there are also libraries, this one is Spectra, that we build where you can use in Python all libraries that allow you to move from graphs to embedded spaces and do your processing. And then from there, you can go back. And then you can control all the statistics, the confidence level, the false positives, depending on your problem. So I think that uh, with this, I conclude my presentation. Uh, I hope that it was of interest to you and that it will open some new research opportunities in your, in your specific field. Thank you. Anyone has a question for the speaker, please? Anyone has a question? We'll ask for questions. I hope it was not too complex. Saying is that the most natural way what the people generally do 
they do a mapping and then they use some simple techniques by implicitly assuming that the space is linear, so they use some Euclidean distance. <coughs> However, that is wrong if uh, your problem is complex, as those coming from graphs or representation, which means that you, should, you don't know a priori which is your method of what you build, or at least it has to be non-linear in many programs. So that's why hyperspherical or uh, sorry, hyperbolical or hyperspherical are very simple representation of non-linear manifolds where we can control everything in there because we are able to write down the equations associated with the distance between two points. That is called the geodesic, the geodesic distance. With the neural networks, if you do this exercise of mapping, you don't know which type of manifold you have. So you don't know a priori which distance you should consider. And that's why you have adversarial learning that is imposing constraints on the final representation. So you are requesting the concept of statistics and you want the points, a cat, or all the family of cats to be mapped in one point and around that point there is a distribution. You see? You don't want to mix up everything. And then once you do this exercise, if there are two cats, you want to look at the distances. Because based on the distances, you build a hypothesis test. Is this a cat or this is not a cat? In order to do that, you need to evaluate the distances. And in order to evaluate the distances, you need to control the shape of the manifold. And that is what you do. So you might request it to be hyperspherical or uh, hyperbolical or flat, hyperplane. And then what you can do is to do examples of those manifolds and you make a further decision. Well. Any more question? Any more question? Yes, sir. Yeah, yeah. So when you log into the internet, they frequently put up, I don't know the name for it, this picture of you know something and they say, find, find all the places where there's a telephone pole, find all the places where there's a car, and I mean, there's find all the places where there's bridges and lights, okay? Now, why do they do that? They do that because machines can't do it, right? So that's what you should be training on. That's a question. Yeah, I mean, uh, yeah, uh, well, we do those uh, things to say uh, you are not a robot, okay? But in reality, uh, if I knew you, you enough, I can control the procedure in a way. I can even think of learning how you do that. I can carry out a cyber attacks, so I can play with that. You'll never... Yep. The user has, you know, two eyes and ears and a certain experience and that's my point is that we're very good at doing that task the error rate is extremely low unless you don't have good vision or your glasses yeah. aren't on totally. so this is obvious that why is that task interesting that task is interesting because humans can do it and machines can't yeah. so that's the kind of a problem that you should be attacking on that's my position is you should be attacking problems but the listen, uh, it's not about chess. No, no, no. But listen, if the machine were able to see those pictures, the machine can solve the problem. You can see the pictures. They're coming from the oh, no, no, no. I mean, no. Yeah, but if, uh, the machine, if the attacker can see the pictures, it is very easy to say whether there is a, a road sign or if there is a car in there. The problem is that the attacker is not in possess of that information, and that's why. So the, you generate, you say, okay, I want to generate now this type of problem on your laptop. And then what you see are pictures containing different objects and the question. So if on the other side you don't know what's going on, it is very difficult to say that. But if I were able to get a snapshot of your screen, that problem is easily solved. Is this all? Yes. Better than humans. 
So, um, the question regarding that you have here uh, is posing this constant. Yes. Um, how do you still solve the prior problem? How do you know the prior institution? Right. Problem? So, to have something which is manageable, because a priori you don't know which is the prior institution. Okay. If you knew that, you go to your prior institution. If not, what do you request? is uh, your graph, your input points, to be mapped on something which is uh, manageable. So you control the destination distribution, and that's it. And then you make a decision there. Then the problem is when, from that space, you want to go back to the original. And in that case, what you can show is that you can go back but the eigenvalues associated with uh, uh, the information matrix, which is basically the p-values associated with distribution, are different. You see? So you start from something that you, you don't know, you impose a constraint. If the autoencoder is able to solve the problem, which means that it's reaching the convergence of the autoencoder, it means that you can transform your prior into a different distribution that works reasonably well. Uh, uh, yes. I think, okay. Yes, absolutely. Okay, so we have some time pressure. We need to respect the schedule. So, thank you, Professor uh, Caesar Alapi, for your amazing talk. I think uh, after. Uh, Professor Radu Bhavet has given a very interesting overview on the theme of the conference and this was more on unstructured data and uh, getting into the deep learning formulas. I think this is what the conference is for the next couple of days. So I think both these talks were very, very, very relevant to uh, you know, the theme of the conference. So thank you Professor Alapi for your very, very interesting talk and we have a small moment for you. Your, your problem is a luggage, my problem is your photo is, you have a photograph. I can't give it to anyone else. So, uh, with this uh, introductory talk by Professor Waring, and now uh, we had uh, the first keynote talk by Professor Caesar Alapi. Now it's time for us to get into an informal panel discussion. Uh, I'll invite the panelists to come down to the stage. I have the list. A moment, please. Okay, so I invite uh, Professor Alexander from University of Northern Iowa, United States. I invite Professor Rossi Sechi, Cardiff University, United Kingdom. Please join us on the stage. I invite Professor Anna Sophia from University of Iceland. I invite uh, Professor John Allen from uh, LNS Obana Champion. I invite Professor Zanufon from Matabal University, United States. I invite Professor Carlos, University of Las Palmas, Spain. I invite Professor Fred Chubina, University of Nebraska, Lincoln, United States. Professor P. 
Pio University of Ljubljana, Slovenia, <laughs> Professor Stephen Pistorius, University of Manitoba, Canada, <laughs> Professor Ikta Faruddin Khan, Old Dominion University, United States, <laughs> Professor Hamid Vakazadian, University of Nebraska, United States, <laughs> Professor Jean Piri, University of Illinois St. Albana Champagne. Radim, you can also join us in case if you are willing so. Professor Don Juan, if you are willing so, you can join us. I, you can join us. Also, uh, anyone, I think, uh, anyone, any other expert speaker, you know, because I did not take a formal consent for the others, but still, if you are willing, you can be most welcome to join us at the stage. I did not take a, otherwise I did not take a, uh, you know, consent for you. Great. Okay, so we will uh, we will uh, we come up to uh, okay. So you see the this is a panel discussion and uh, this is you know more of a very informal kind of a panel discussion where the panelists are there. They can give their opinion or they can take a question. So to respect the time, we have to keep it short. Uh, See, the, the topic of this panel discussion is, I, I will give you a small introduction, futuristic computing and applications. So when you say computing, it's, you don't think that only the computer science engineering graduates are going to study computing. You know, computing is a part of almost everything. I mentioned in my morning lecture also, a mechanical engineer knows, should know computing. An electrical engineer should know computing. A biologist should know computing. Okay, a civil engineer should know computing. So where are the applications and where are we heading to also? The challenges, opportunities, the scope for a young student like you. You know, even if you are a mechanical engineer, you are an electrical engineer, you are a biologist, you are a biotechnology scientist, still you need to understand what is the future of computing and where do you apply computing in your, in your, relevant, uh, you know, in your uh, uh, relevant field. So, uh, so the, it, it's, it will be a very open panel discussion. So also I can, uh, if Professor Socrates is willingly is willing, you can always join us in the stage, Professor Socrates, if you are willing. I had uh, taken a formal consent from you, right? In case you adjust, I think. So maybe, you know, uh, we will start the discussion. We will start the discussion. Uh, you know, artificial intelligence or machine learning or deep learning, how is it interrelated to your branch? And uh, the two talks given by Professor Radim and, uh, you know, Professor Cesar LLP is already given, you know, an amazing start to the conference where you know what is going on. And I keep it very, very informal. I keep it uh, very, very informal. This discussion, I keep it very informal. And, uh, okay. So maybe mm, you're close to me. So you start the discussion about something. Professor Jean Perry. Great. Uh, what should I say? <laughs> in, in the two parts. The students can ask. We are there to answer. And uh, maybe, you know, uh, maybe who has a, a deep learning? Maybe. Uh, any Anybody have any question? Okay. Uh, hi everyone. Um, I'll try to open this session, but I won't be very... Uh, I'll try to be more specific because I know what is a problem in my research area and uh, probably I won't say anything useful in terms of combinatorial generalization, right? Um, because that is, I don't know, a thing that I, I strongly believe whoever will solve the problem will be a Nobel Prize winner, okay? Um, so to be more specific, I work in a field of biometrics so um, a few years back, it was quite easy to actually find a niche because of deep learning itself. Um, so for instance, we were heading towards um, investigating new modalities uh, like uh, sclera, like ears and similar, and we actually performed incredibly well with those new modalities using deep learning methodologies. Of course, in the recent two years, we noticed one thing. Um, big companies uh, are making huge progresses because they have 
huge processing power. And we can't compete with that anymore. Even though we get donations from NVIDIA and etc., it's just not enough. So we are again looking for niches. And one of those that I think is uh, important for the well, general society um, and that we can actually contribute to is um, tackling something uh, related to, for instance, deepfakes. The ma major problem there is that we don't have good tools to actually detect such deepfakes. So, such uh, um, synthetic videos and images. The other thing that we are faced with is that, um, like Professor Olipi kind of mentioned, um, in terms of um, adversarial attacks, we are facing the challenge of probing the systems that uh, exist now and are based on deep learning um, in order to actually prove that they are not as perfect as they are pictured, right? As they are um, kind of presented in papers. So that is another thing, another niche for us. Um, what else? What else is there? Um, I don't know, perhaps. Yeah, I mean, it's pretty open. Maybe we can keep it focused. Maybe, for sure, Rossi, you were into more of robotics, right? Yeah, and so can we have a little bit of your view how, uh, what kind of computing and future scopes in your area? Maybe, great. Thank you. In general, I think that in engineering and computer science, we need really to focus on the global challenges. And we are known the aging population health and well-being, clean energy, um, climate change. So the future of our science and engineering is one which reflects those needs for global solutions. So this is the first thing to say. In terms of technology, I think the future of computing and robotics has a human face, but not in the sense you may think, not robots which look like people, not AI which mimics um, processes, um, and not designs which mimic uh, nature necessarily, but human-like AI, AI which is understandable by people, which is trusted, in fact, we need new algorithms for that because despite of all the advances in uh, AI which resemble human thinking like um, case-based reasoning, fuzzy logic, neural network, net uh, networks were all inspired by um, you know, the, studying the way people think. I think we need radically new approaches to, to AI. Um, in terms of robotics, I think the, fu the future is human-centered robotics. Uh, as I said, not necessarily uh, robots uh, resembling the appearance of people. I actually don't subscribe to that view at all. Uh, but robots which collaborate with people, which can understand people, can uh, predict in the way we interact. When we look at each other, we know what the person may do next. Okay, so robotics which can understand human behavior, this is what we need. And we also need people who can understand better technology because this is another another big issue. So for me, the future of computing and robotics is human-like AI and human-centered robotics. Yeah, so Professor Rossi is the human machine interaction. A lot of work you have done great. Maybe uh, oh, Professor Hamid has a you have the mic there. Can you please pass it out, please? I'm missing Professor uh, Tarek Ghazali. Is he here? 
Oh, I have, in, I have invited you for this. So you are into some, you know, some very interesting, can you, Professor, can you just join us actually? You have that reviewing stuff, I, I'm sorry I missed you or something. Yeah. Okay, great. Okay. Well, thank you. Uh, you can join me here.
to the big uh, you know, uh, companies like Intel and the like. So they have a tensor processing unit. They are actually having a quantum computer, uh, you know, things of that nature. So, so it looks like from the computing perspective, uh, at least, and I do realize the fact it's not number crunching just anymore. We need to look at inferences per second. We need to look at uh, how much data we can process per second. I think from the processing perspective, we're going to be seeing a very rich uh, kind of, of uh, if you will, era coming at us where uh, many companies, not just the traditional electronic companies, producing things that are application-oriented, processors, hardware, uh, we're going to see a great deal of heterogeneity. We'll not be dealing with the same types of things that we are dealing with. Uh, I just actually attended a talk for uh, Facebook where they have been showing a lot of the hardware that they are developing. Uh, and uh, we're going to be probably having a very active time ahead of us uh, until probably we know whether in 10 years from now uh, is quantum computing going to solve it for us or we're going to have to just have a mix of all of the above. Uh, so I think it's an exciting time to be learning and to be a student because you'll be probably exposed to a lot more concepts that many of us in the past and uh, many exciting developments coming at you at a very high rate as well. Uh, but it would be all enabling applications that we have never thought of before, and I probably would stop here. Okay, um, I'm listening to this, and I'm having all sorts of, you know, breaking out in cold sweats thinking about this. So there seems to be this belief that we're going to make computers work like humans do. And until we reach that goal, we've failed. So we want to have computers that are as smart as we are. Well, that's not what computers are good at. Computers are good at looking things up very fast and verifying facts. They're very good at dealing with facts. So how about a little Pinocchio face on the television set <clears throat> that is listening to what's going on and the nose gets long when the person lies. This is actually would be extremely valuable if you could prove that that little Pinocchio face was highly reliable with an error of 10 to the minus 20th. And then any time somebody says something that's wrong, Pinocchio's nose gets long, and the machine could do that task, because it can look up the facts. If it can do speech recognition and you know figure out look up instantly. We're, we're really, really bad. You got a billion people looking at their television set, and they don't know if the person is saying something that's true. I mean, I listen to Donald Trump, I know what he's saying isn't true. So, but what I need is a machine that's a Pinocchio face that every time something is incorrect that's been said, this Pinocchio nose goes bang. That machine could do that, and that would be a very, very valuable tool because everybody knows that Pinocchio is telling the truth. When its nose gets long, it knows that that's not true. You don't need that. You don't need that for Trump, we all know that already. That would be a waste of technology. <laughs> Anytime you hear it, you can give us a mistake. You have a mic then. I, I, I love this idea. I do. I want such a Pinocchio. However, the question is, how are people going to know whether to trust that Pinocchio or not? Okay, you know that you can trust Pinocchio. The billion people who uh, trust any lie right here won't be trusted. Well, they should be able to talk to Pinocchio and they have to convince themselves that when they lie, Pinocchio knows. Okay, so, and that was not a pun, but I guess it turned into one. Pinocchio knows. So, I mean, the whole point is that the machine is capable of fact-checking, and that's what we can't do. You get the New York Times, and three days later, you get a fact-check on something. So, but this machine, if it's got a clear set of facts, if it understands speech recognition well enough and looks it up, you can say, well, why did that nose get long? Well, this statement was made, and this statement was wrong, and you look at it, well, that wasn't even the statement that we're worried about. So, yeah, I think you can solve that problem. Great, so, yeah, first, first comment, yeah. Essentially, what's going to happen is, uh, is AI deep learning, all these oh. methods that are coming up. Uh, of course, 
question is going to be more. I'm sorry. So uh, the, the question is going to be more like, can we trust um, these these methods, these techniques uh, that are that are coming up? So it's going to go back to the explainability of these methods. Can you explain what we are seeing? Right. So that's going to be something that we'll have to deal with. We'll have to understand. And one of the speakers in the morning actually pointed out a little bit that there is no unifying math, so to speak, no theory. We get all these amazing results, but we really don't know how and why it's happening. So that's something that some of you in this audience hopefully will look into it in the future. And that is then tied to this trust factor. And that then also goes into ethics, right? So all these methods that we're seeing now, all these space geovision and everything that you're seeing there, uh, this question of ethics is going to be very important in the future. You're going to find out, is it really allowed, what I'm trying to do? We're well, now seeing this sort of pervasive use, uses of these methods, right? All these techniques. So all these are very difficult problems. These are societal problems uh, that we human beings, we are challenged. Now think about that a machine is trying to solve that problem. So these are some of the difficult problems that, that we're looking at next perhaps 10 or so years. Great. Yeah, yeah. Professor Zenon, that's something that right. That's something that any part of the mic, please. Okay, uh, I guess I can follow uh, this thread. At least uh, I'm trying to say what I will be doing in the next few years and probably I hope that uh, some people will find things interesting. So everybody talked about uh, trustworthy AI. Uh, one of the uh, nice terms to put it, what we need to develop is engineering for AI. So the current state of the art is that you can do very uh, astonishing results in the lab playing with these neural networks, uh, but you cannot do that for real life. Let's try to see what you have to do in order to design the power grid of India. How much engineering, how much trust is going to that, what methods you have to develop to keep people have electricity constantly. So if we like AI to affect our lives, it has to be transported at the same level. And I think engineers have to solve this problem. It's not enough to go in the lab, have a robot, do a fancy task. It's not enough to see a video that I can create a fake face. But if I have to leave to put these pro products that affect our life, there is a lot of work that is required for engineers to do. And take this from kind of science fiction kind of development of real systems that we can uh, rely on. Great. So, you see, we already are getting very interesting inputs. Maybe, uh, you know, how the application part becomes also important. And I'd like to have some inputs from Professor Socrates. Because he's not a computer scientist. You're not a computer scientist. No, I am not. But still, you know, what, what do you think? Like uh, a conventional science, like material science, how much is it affected by computing? Maybe we'd like to have your inputs on that. Well, it's already affecting it quite a bit, in some good ways and in some, probably I would call it negative ways. And before I talk about that, we make a comment about artificial intelligence, the way John Allen um, worries about it, that uh, there are some things that the machines can do and some that they cannot. I heard in the first talk today about artificial intelligence, maybe it's coming in three years or maybe in 13 years or maybe in so many years, but uh, and an example was mentioned like playing chess. Now, I'm not sure that I would even call the playing chess intelligence because it's a very well-defined thing. That it's a computation more than any, you know how many possibilities are there in future in, in future movements, and then the computer can win a lot faster than a human being, but intelligence would be to having a scientific discussion with the computer. We have a scientific research problem that we don't even know how to approach. Can the machine help us there? The machine has the ability to know, in some sense, a lot more than a human knows. 
and can access that information a lot faster. But intelligence would be, can the machine think and help me to solve my problem without explaining to the machine what the problem exactly is? I mean, you can tell them the problem. I'm trying to resolve a, a transport problem in a nanostructure. And I'm dumbfounded. I don't know how to proceed here. Machine, you know a lot more than I do. You have access to more information. That might be interesting if it happens, but it may not happen for 100 years or 200 years. So I don't know how and beyond. So setting, setting targets for 10 or 15 years, I think the, the bar is very low. Now, let me make a second point about how I, there are negative aspects of, of computation. When I started doing research as a graduate student in the early 1970s, uh, 1969 and beyond, and then I didn't get into computing right away, but gradually I did, and we were at a stage when we had to formulate the problem, the physics of the problem, and then we had to write our own codes. There were no codes anywhere that would help us. And if we need help from computer scientists, we would ask around to find out what's going on. I remember when we looked around, we, we had to do a lot of Fourier transforms, and they were slow. And we found it that was extremely slow. We couldn't live with them. And we got word that I was at IBM at the time, there are people working on fast Fourier transforms. And we got the early versions of those codes before they, even the world knew about it, and they helped us out a lot. Now, in the process, we were learning physics and we were learning computing. Nowadays, the young people get can code. There are so many can codes. They don't engage in the process of figuring out the physics, how to design the codes, how to proceed, and then really learning the fundamentals. And we get a lot of students who get trained how to do calculations because they can run the codes and get results but they are not trained in the science, so they are losing some of the science when it becomes very easy to compute and solve equations without getting to the bottom of physics. So I don't know how that is going to play out and what's going to happen in the future, but there are some dangers there and there are some promises. So I'll leave it yeah, let's see what the, I'll explain uh, what he, he was mentioning. It's very really scary actually. Let's say, you know, 25 years back in our country, if you want to do a Fourier transform, you have to take the pen and start doing the Fourier transform. You do all the equations and you start doing it. Today, a guy, you know, in, in, in Python or in a C programming or in a MATLAB, you write FFT and it shows. So it's so scary. <laughs> I mean, uh, that's what is a concern. So we are, I don't know if somebody can speak on that, you know. Um, maybe this computing, computing, computing tools that is coming up, not sure if it actually weakens the basic fundamentals of an engineering graduate with so much of uh, ready-made libraries and things coming up. Maybe he may not understand what is Fourier transform rather than use it lying in, in his regular work. That's, that's scary. Yeah, some of them are very good because uh, I, was using, I was using matrix diagonalization routines back then and I didn't have to worry about how you do that, right? I could just invoke matrix diagonalization, I was happy with it. So I don't have to always know everything, right? Yeah, you see, I'll, uh, maybe, um, uh, you see, you know, once again, we have Professor Stephens with us. Maybe I'd like to have, because he's once again not a, no, I would like to have a comment on him, huh? because, you see, he's not a computer scientist, but still I would like to know, you are into a, a lot of biomedical stuff and medical devices and all, but how do you look into that? You know, you are not a computer scientist, particularly, but what computer has to play, you know, uh, high computing or how is, how, what role or what scope is had for the future thing for your medical device? I would like to know if the audience likes to know about that. Okay. Uh, yes, you're right. I'm not a computer scientist, so I can't provide any uh, words of wisdom as to where computing si computer science is going to go in the next 10 years or so. But I do have a plea. Uh, medical imaging has been reliant on computing for many years. Uh, you know, in the 1970s, we started with, you know, CT. Uh, we've had MRI recently. Both of those tools are heavily dependent on computing. Uh, both of them won Nobel Prizes, as it happens to be. Um, but the devices that developed from those were large and expensive. And while they produce exquisite images uh, for us and uh, probably very valuable, uh, unfortunately, because of their expense, uh, only a limited 
part of the world's population actually get access to these sorts of devices. And so my plea really is to, in developing things, if we can find ways of using computing and, and new uh, computing technologies to actually reduce the cost of these sorts of devices and to provide us greater access to the world's community to, to high quality diagnostic imaging devices, that would be be wonderful. So if, if, if anything, it's really, can we take this technology and try and find ways of reducing the cost of making it more available uh, in, in devices that are useful? Hello, everyone. First of all, I'd like to say to the young people, um, I'm not a young person anymore. And I'm not very old either. And I also want to tell you that life goes very fast. And over 15 years ago, I was a PhD student in the United States. And I owe my education to the United States, so I'm always grateful for that. Um, and I was in a special position. I was a teaching assistant. And I could select my own PhD topic. I had an excellent advisor and he said, well, you can just go out there and figure out something out. So I spent six months on routing and decided, no, um, the uh, theoretical background is not very stable for this one. And then I started to study uh, adaptive control system. And I forgot to say I'm a controls person, automatic controls person. And in automatic control, like in your cruise control, for example, or um, uh, air conditioning, you usually have a closed loop. You have a closed loop. You're measuring something, you're feeding stuff back, and then you act on what you want to do, and you have a closed loop. And when you have a closed loop, uh, stability is an issue. And that's the thinking of where how can AI be incorporated into control systems, you must be able to ensure stability. In particular, if you're transporting people uh, in automobiles, on, in aircraft. So that is the main challenge and the issue. If you do an open loop something, for example, signal processing of music or face recognition, it's a kind of an open loop thing in a sense, and so there it may be less dangerous to apply it. So we always need to think about stability, and that's the main issue in closely controlled. Um, first of all, I think that um, thank you for the touch to invite me up here. Uh, second thing is that we are relatively, uh, relatively quiet on this side, right? so I want to make a bit of noise as well. Okay. Okay. Now, uh, what I'm trying to do is uh, first pose a few questions and then uh, sort of point out a few problems with AI, and then uh, the last thing I would relate to a few of the problems that people already mentioned here. Okay, so first few questions. Uh, like, uh, suppose we have uh, infinite computing power, okay? Can we solve our problem uh, or not? A complicated problem or not, right? I, I, I find it to say it's, it's depend on our brain, our intelligence, not depend on the infinite power, power right? For example, I, I'm very interested in problem solving. First of all, like if you pose a question, right? Some question very simple, but you cannot solve it. It's so difficult to solve it. So how did you solve that kind of problem? Some pro some question is very look like complicated. But you can solve it one step, two step. That's it. You can solve it easily. Okay. But the problem is that what you do. The, the way I see that is that the problem is posed and then you somehow decompose it into many dimensions. Sometimes it's time dimension, sometimes it's frequency dimension, space dimension, and other dimension. And I might be even very large uh, uh, 
number of dimension, and then you use your intelligence how to combine or extract that type feature of the dimension to solve the problem. Usually, it's kind of decompose and then try to find a way to manipulate that to get a solution. So the problem with AI is what I see that because I did a lot of neural kind of network a while back, and I was one of those guys who gave up and went to something else. Right? Is uh, for example, you have a very large amount of data with the deep learning. You don't even know what sort of how many layer, what sort of texture that you need to use in order to do something. You know, and then you try to have initial state to kind of you know, work out some kind of feature. Right. So the thing is that it's a very ad hoc way, you know, to actually solve a problem, even though the the, the way you solve that, it seems to be work better than some other machine learning technique. But it's still very ad hoc, you know, to me. The, the graph, the, the, the earlier you know, keynote speaker, right, very interesting. The way you control the learning as well, where I mentioned later about the learning. But the fact that the way you get the graph in the first place, you already limit the, the, what you can solve at the end. Because but why, why is this graph? Why not the other? Why this picture? Right? Because you only depend on a picture, a certain graph, and that immediately is limit the way you can solve the problem. It's our human being is might be using the eye, ear, the sense, many other things. So that will depend on the way you pose the question as well. Or the say, suppose you have infinite amount of data. What kind of data is available? It's not just an infinite amount of data. The deep learning requires tons and tons of data. But are they relevant or not? You don't have a thought, you don't get a solve problem. The second thing is that when you're talking about unsupervised learning, the learning is not unsupervised really. They're actually learning already fixed before you start learning. How do you clusterize something? is that you already decided what to clusterize, what's the characteristic that you clusterize already. So you are really limit that kind of learning. Right? So that, that is the problem I can see is that the learning is not adaptive enough. Right? The second thing is architecture is very ad hoc. Right? Now, the problem with people mentioned about trust and medical, I love it because in fact part of the thing, I'm, see how do we trust people. Right? It's very difficult because I, I work on cyber security. Right? You see, the system say relatively secure, but it's not trusted. Right? Not trusted. Right? Because uh, people can go rogue and do something inside it and do a lot of things. Or maybe that a human being problem, when you meet someone, right? how do you trust the person in the first place in order to move further, to get more connection and then do some research together. That's a trust thing. What I'd love to do is that if we have a artificial intelligence, you actually using that kind of power of knowledge to actually understand the brain and relate it to how you can detect early detection of all the diseases. That's what I think is really interesting. Because my belief is very simple. The brain knows everything about what's going on in your body, right? I believe that. But you ignore all those things here until it happens, then you pay focus to that. Otherwise, the brain knows everything before everything else. If you can actually do that, you can solve this kind of problem.
computational drug discovery, uh, getting uh, enough data for even testing, if not for training the algorithms, is very, very difficult. And uh, uh, the problem uh, in large part is due to privacy laws. Uh, quality data in drug discovery uh, and human health is in electronic medical records and access to those records these days is becoming very, very difficult. So I don't know whether there are any lawyers in the, in the audience that can educate us in this regard, but uh, I myself I am very frustrated with, uh, with, uh, with the lack of quality data when it comes to, to patient records and, and, and again uh, related to, to uh, really uh, vibrant field and, and, and developing field of, of, of privacy laws. Very interesting talks. So the, the problem the problem is that we can't trust a problem is that we can't trust AI. The reason we can't trust it is because we don't understand what it's doing. This has been in the newspapers a lot lately. So the computer, the AI models are very good at mimicking human performance, and then we find out that the human performance is, um, is prejudice against some population, okay? So it works great. It does exactly what the humans are doing, and it's exactly what we don't want to do. So you can't trust it. And until we solve that problem, it's not going anywhere. It's not going to go anywhere unless we can trust it. And in order to trust it, you have to understand what it's going to do. So here's a very simple Turing test. This software is so smart, we should just teach it to tell us what's going on. And we'll turn around and we'll ask it, how can you make yourself smarter? And how can you avoid bias? And until it can answer that question, I'm sorry, but it's kind of useless. The way the computing has become a part of our life, uh, I mean, we all appreciate the one is to check into a hotel. If they do not offer you a cup of tea, maybe we live with that. Uh, if they do not give us a Wi-Fi, we can't live with that, I guess. Uh, <laughs> I mean, the Indian kids, the students, I mean, will ask if will open it for some questions also. So how, many of you, uh, how many of you guys uh, do online food orders? Do you use uh, online portals, uh, online applications for ordering food? How many of you do that? By the How many of you do uh, reservations, uh, online reservations? Great. So, uh, I mean, so you are already into computing. You can't live with that. So of course, there are many other stuff like making friends and dating and things going on. Uh, Professor Carlos has something to add. Great. Yep. Okay, thank you. <coughs> um, I think that uh, everyone is clear that we live in a digital time. Um, for example, if we can see 10 years ago, uh, maybe it can be possible to speak about a different application, a different method that we are speaking now. Uh, it's very difficult. Which is the different 10, 10 years ago and uh, nowadays? Uh, maybe we have uh, better sensors, better devices, uh, better uh, microprocessors, uh, high and why nowadays we, we can have the 5G for, for mobile network. Uh, we have many, many, many kinds of variables uh, that say that we can speak nowadays, we can speak about the very uh, complex and very difficult maybe to give us uh, questions. I think that uh, the question is the, the computing which is the future of the computing. I think the computing uh, is the present and the computing will be the future. Uh, many, many uh, in, in 10 years, in the next 10 years, maybe we can have a, 
a new uh, approaches, a new paradigm uh, in another to, to speak. Uh, we can have uh, more sensors, different sensors. We can have a better microprocessors, which is final, the final idea. The final idea is that we can have uh, real applications. Uh, I suppose that each one have a smart mobile. It's in, the, in this room, you can... Uh, we, the people that have mobiles here, smart mobiles, everyone, okay? But 10 years ago, I, I think so that you have another kind of device. Uh, because uh, I think it's a very important point to the companies, the economical reason. Uh, maybe the idea is to have a better applications that uh, the people can use and the mobile, the, these companies about uh, speaking about the mobiles, uh, develop uh, this kind of application, the kind of devices in order to have uh, a better microprocessor, in order to have this real application that we can have. Uh, the question where is the question is in companies like Google, Amazon, the, uh, the question is the imagination. What, what thing we can have for the future? We can develop this kind of application for the future and it's possible with the technology. Uh, now we are speaking about the, the, the research here, but this research in 10 years will be a product that we can use in, in all mobiles or in another kind of devices. This is the, the idea. I think that the, the question, the future, is the, the computing, and um, the question is to have real application.
Okay, thank you very much. Um, so I was given this microphone first and I said, what can I say because there was so much to say about it. Um, my career started as a physicist to try to investigate device, which is a basic element of a computer. And so, um, so we have been very, very far and very deep in, in terms of uh, actually achieving devices that are able, in fact, to give us a computing power that we have today. But uh, and this device is a very simple device. It's just a switch. It's on, off. But right now, we are actually reaching a limit. Uh, we have been predicting this uh, more slow would actually, uh, actually reach uh, its end uh, several times, but it seems that actually now the end of the tunnel is there because the device and the transistor that we are able to fabricate now have the size of uh, you know few nanometers and it's very difficult to see how we can go uh, behind that. Um, so the, the real problem, so what we thought, we would say the question is, imagine we, can, we have infinite power. I mean, that's a question because I don't think that we will have infinite power anyway because we are going to be limited by this and our problem that are facing I mean the computer the, 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 the scientific community and the engineering community is actually essentially an architectural problem we are also limited by uh, heat dissipation in, in, in computer and things like that. all of this are limited so the, 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 the future if you would ask me in terms of uh, nanotechnology because we are reaching this level is actually is it able in fact to go behind, you know, the solid state approach or the silicon approach that we have been using it, which has been so, so powerful in the last 60 years, okay? And one of, I mean, I'm talking about my research, one of these important issues is that uh, because the brain and the human is so powerful, but it has some limitation, okay? We know the limitation, our, uh, Time scale in terms of sleeping is of, of the order of let's say a, a few tenths of milliseconds. Okay, where in terms of switching, you know, computer can be very fast. Okay, they go at the order of uh, I mean they can switch in terms of, of, of actually a few picoseconds. All right. On the other hand, uh, we are extremely sensitive to external conditions uh, like temperature and things like this. Right. Right. So we are not very reliable. On the other hand, the computer is very reliable. Then we, can, we have actually we have we, we have experienced this. So I think that one of the main challenges at the basic level for the future would be: Is there a way? And this has been a question that I have been asking myself for some time. To be able to combine instead of trying to find something which is similar to the brain, six like to understand: Is there a way actually to make to combine, uh, in fact, the power of human computing? with actually the power and the, 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 the speed, the reliability of the solid state system. I think this is a no question. As last centuries has been the century of quantum mechanics, uh, solid state, chemistry, okay, which was all individual discipline. Biology, I think that the 21st century will be actually the century of the the center which are going to merge the science actually to, make, to, to try to understand the interaction between biology, for example, solid state or biology chemistry, or, and, and try to find solutions to the problem which are actually raised by the, uh, artificial intelligence, try to go beyond the revolution, the information revolution. Thank you. So, so, so maybe the random is that I'll ask you to go for that final point. I think everybody has given only. No, you know, let me ask you a question, you know, uh, see, you all discussed like computing, human beings, computers. So let me ask you a question, let me make a, because many of you are graduate students also. Tell me, you want to find a match for yourself? You can do it better or the computer can do it better? What do you think? You're <laughs> trying to find a match for yourself. So what do you think, the computer can do it better than you actually do it? How? <laughs> How many of you agree that the computer will do it better for you? Raise your hands, please. Oh, great. How many of you think that you can do it better than the computer? <laughs> so, uh, so the computing people have to work a little bit more so that these hands actually get 
whatever. So they are convinced that the computer can do it better. So still, what I you know what I what I mean is still there are many things which human beings can do better than the computers. Don't be you know, get Maybe we'll have the final uh, remarks from Professor Radin, and we'll keep it open for some questions. Okay, thank you. Well. Uh how artificial intelligence is being divided is too narrow. Artificial intelligence, general uh, artificial intelligence, and super intelligence. The narrow artificial intelligence is we are surrounded by that. Everywhere we are using a smartphone. Everywhere, uh, uh, anytime we are using a Google, for example, we are using so-called uh, artificial uh, narrow intelligence. In the sense, it is something uh, very common, and all of us know it. All of us are using it. Uh, well, uh, there was a question: how to make uh, that we can trust or understand the artificial intelligence? It is uh, the uh, thing that is being uh, called explainable AI. And uh, right now, there are a couple of projects in support of such a projects uh, all over the world. So, in coming years, it is expected that there will be a significant progress. Another major part was that uh, we uh, that computers should think like human do. When we are talking about the thinking like uh, human beings, we are talking about a general uh, artificial general intelligence, and there is nothing like that right now. There is uh, well, uh, whenever if we ever reach artificial uh, general intelligence, it is being said that this is the last invention that humanity uh, has to do, since uh, it will be much, much better. No one of us can read in a 10 seconds 10 millions of papers. No one of us would be able to be an expert in a brain a human. It takes 18 years or 21 years, depends on the country. Uh, uh, I mean, uh, when uh, one, someone is uh, being considered to be an adult, uh, to copy, uh, well, uh, human brain capacity, memory capacity is being uh, estimated to 100 terabytes. Uh, to copy terabytes is a matter of 10 seconds. So to, to transfer experience is really fast. Uh, so this, if we, during my life or ever, will reach general artificial intelligence, it will be for us uh, significant contribution. Uh, it, was, it will help us to solve uh, us, uh, many problems that we are not right now uh, able to solve. Anyway, I don't uh, agree that uh, when we are playing chess with computer, uh, it's not a win since uh, he's not thinking about it. Uh, in my opinion, it doesn't matter. There are rules, there are given uh, exact rules. And it doesn't matter whether there is a cat, monkey, human, or computer, it counts only who is better. And from 2012, there was no any, uh, on a professional level, I, uh, I mean, uh, there was no any win of a human in chess uh, when there was a human with computer. And computer from 2012 improved significantly. Uh, for example, uh, when I'm talking about the Deep Blue in 1997, who uh, beat uh, uh, Kasparov, Kaspar. uh, uh, it was uh, two years ago in, uh, at the University of uh, Alberta, they told me they uh, trained a neural network. Uh, it uh, was uh, four hours uh, on uh, 1,000 of GPUs. And uh, it won uh, with the deep blue uh, 100 to 0. So, thank you. Great. So, can we have a huge round of applause for all the people who are doing this? So, can we, uh, we, we can take some questions? You know, many of you are computer science graduates. You have questions, many hands rising up. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yes, can you stand? Tell your name and ask a question, please. So, my name is Ashtosh Kumar, and my question is to Mr. Khan. As Mr. Khan said that we Mr. Khan have... is Professor Khan. Yeah. Yeah. Sorry, Professor Khan. So, uh, he said that we have to use ethics for... Uh, uh, we have to apply ethics in computing. But as in reality, we are seeing that the computing 
and the AI is being, on the other hand, is useful for the professionals, but as a, it is being using as a weapon for the different uh, uh, governments and organizations to just secure their thrones, like we have seen uh, different cases like the murder of Jamal Fugoshi and the uh, confronting of the protesters in Hong Kong and the social security system in China. So what we are been doing and developing to confront them and stop them for using in the wrong hands. So uh, this is an excellent question. Uh, just because uh, this, just because this, this, uh, tools are being used does not mean that people are not thinking about it. So there have been actually a lot of activities going on in different parts of the world. Uh, in fact, I myself is a part of an IEEE working group. Uh, we're working all over the globe, people from different parts of the world. We're working on this multi-year working group to develop standard for IEEE. Uh, European Union just came up with guidelines you might know. So, uh, and same thing is happening in States and other places. So yes, this is going to be a challenge. Uh, it's not easy uh, because us, we human being, we come up with these these novel uh, tools, techniques, and then uh, we have this tendency to use them as we wish, right? And we also need to be constrained in some way or some fashion to make it really uh, to, to benefit the humanity. So yes, people are thinking about it. There are a lot of people working, and uh, they are trying to come up with the solution. So, my second question is to the all panelists: that what are the steps we are confronting towards the deep fake learning? Deep fake learning. We didn't get you. Maybe can you repeat? Uh, what are the steps we are taking to confront deep fake learning? I don't know anyone. I'm not sure. Uh, uh, deep fake learning. Uh, uh, there was a video back uh, when uh, you said? Uh, yeah. uh, there was a video uh, four or five years ago in which the Mr. Obama is just telling uh, something. There was a video, but actually in the reality he was not telling. So we, uh, yeah, uh, he get there. Uh, every one of us can read on the internet any news in the text form. We are used to that. Uh, we need to get to used to that we can see anything on the internet and uh, if we want to trust anything we need to check source and that's all. Thank you. Any more questions please? Yeah. Good evening. Tell sir. your name and tell your name then ask the question. My name is Vipul Tripathi and I am from ITH Kanpur. My question is that uh, after so much advan advancement in AI and machine learning why there is not any genuine model for uh, detection of uh, natural disasters like uh, tsunamis and, uh, and uh, uh, earthquakes? It's a very difficult question. Can somebody figure out? Yeah. Uh, I mean, yes. Uh, there is a lot of advancement in areas we have a lot of data. Unfortunately, in natural disasters, not have a lot of data. The data that needed to be models for good prediction. Uh, and that's kind of an interesting view of all the techniques that we're discussing that are successful. They rely on huge amounts of data. Time, I mean, if you try to address a problem, and actually uh, we talk about uh, drug discovery and the problem there to find data, it's not clear that we have techniques that solve real problems when we do not have data. Actually, there are data being collected on tsunamis, and there are buoys that are sitting around in the ocean, and when they go up and down, they send the signal, and they predict in sometimes hours in advance, and so it gives people the advantage to know they get the heck out of there. So they are solving problems like that, but it requires a concerted effort. I don't think it has anything to do with computing, it has to do with communication. <laughs> but remote sensing people are anyway working on that. It's to be. Anyway, any more questions, please? Yes, uh, you, this side, you have a question? Can you pass on the mic to me? Can you have a volunteer, please? Can you pass on the mic that side, please? Can I have a volunteer to take this mic out here? Hello, everyone. My name is Abhinas Baskar, and I'm a postgraduate student of uh, Center for Advanced Studies. 
Suppose we go to an unknown place and we gather information about environment. On that basis, uh, we create some sort of mapping and estimate our positions and uh, do the task accordingly. So this is how we navigate things. So in machinery or in terms of robotics, how we tackle and mimic human behavior of navigation in unstructured, dynamical and three-dimensional terrain using AI. Even the robot is also dynamic, uh, lots of uh, degree of freedoms it has. Also, uh, how AI is involved in such complex problems, uh, do we have uh, that solutions? Hello, I think you are asking how AI can help human mimicking of movement. Is it that what you are asking? Uh, not exactly. The, the navigation technique. Some sort oh, of way to go to an unknown place. Else can take that question because the question itself is not very clear. Yeah, I think Professor Jason, can you help? Uh, I mean, yeah. Great. Can we have a round of applause for Professor Jason? Please? Uh, to come up to this a little bit because my primary research area is in uh, algorithms for robot navigation. Um, so, you know, the, the question is about how AI can help with uh, you know, capturing sensor data, building some maps, deciding how to navigate, uh, possibly in human-like ways, or possibly, the right question is not human-like, but effective ways of moving around without collisions and achieving some goals. Do, do I understand that right? Yeah, so, um, you know, within the robotics research community, there has been uh, a lot of progress in the last four or five years applying these kinds of uh, learning techniques. Uh, you know, the comment was made that, uh, that AI is most useful when there's lots of data available. Uh, robots make this a very interesting sort of proposition, because robots are capturing data all the time, and that data is guaranteed to be relevant because it's captured from the environment in which the robots operate. Right. Uh, so there's lots of progress on this. Lots of things have, uh, have started to work much better, you know, now that uh, machine learning techniques have become more powerful and the computers are, are capable of executing them. I think the big challenge on that front is that um, there's a gap between what we can do directly using uh, machine learning techniques and what we know how to build directly as engineers using our, our own cleverness. Right? So I, I think the, uh, the challenge going forward for making robots more reliable, more effective, is, is to understand how to build systems that combine these two sources of expertise. Right? Uh, robotics researchers have thought for decades about the right ways to, to get robots to, uh, to move effectively and uh, achieve their goals. And the ideal goal is that we can then start to blend in machine learning techniques, uh, take advantage of the expertise we already have. Right? I think it's an unsolved challenge to, you know, to put these two domains of expertise together. Right? I think that's the, the next big thing that robotics should be thinking about. Thank you, Professor Jason, who just stepped up. Thank you so much for taking the question. Any more questions, please? Can we have the mic for that? Uh, oh, yeah, great. Uh, Hello, my name is Kishan Kare. I'm from IRT Tiagra. And uh, my question is that uh, while uh, giving an answer, we have uh, we always have two choices. Either we calculate it from the beginning, or we use uh, the data we already have acquired. Uh, but uh, there was a theory that the more we rely on the data, the more there are chances for anomalies, and the lesser is the accuracy. If we calculate something from the beginning, uh, the more accurate will be our answer. So, are uh, scientists, uh, data scientists doing something to achieve, to solve this problem? Talking about transfer learning, asking transfer, are you asking about transfer learning? Uh, no, sir, about uh, uh, when we... Because the question is not clear to the panelists, I think, I don't know if anybody has understood it. Because we are not able to understand what you are saying. Because if you are asking about transfer learning, maybe we can, maybe somebody like Rallying or somebody can take up the question, but it's not clear at all. Is your question whether you can merge the two types of data in an intelligent way? You've got the you've got something that you can compute from first principles, and then you have the actual data, yes. and you want to compare the two, and you want to get the best of both worlds. Yes. Sir. I don't know if anybody can pick up this question. Right here. Uh, 
Uh, as Professor Data uh, mentioned, uh, this technique is being called transfer learning. And it is actually behind the whole story about the deep learning uh, from the uh, 2012. Uh, it was uh, started to uh, have a set of uh, 10 million of images. On that uh, set of uh, 10 million of images, they pre-trained actually the networks. And those networks are being applied to absolutely a different domains. Uh, so this technique is very common, and not only for images, as well for audio, as well for text, uh, as well for the other domains. Right. Any more questions, please? Yeah. Um, I I have a question about the uh, My question is specifically for Professor John Dallin. Uh, as we know that AI systems have an associated accuracy. And the maximum we know till now is 99%. My question is, at the end of the day, where do you find most confidence in? Is it automation, is it intelligence, or is it automation of intelligence? What do you think? Well, who's bouncing this microphone? We should stop it, there's <laughs> many. Um, this is, I, I'm pretty sure I'm not gonna be able to answer your question, but I'm going to tell you an experience I had that was, kind of surprising to me. The experience was, worked for 15, 20, maybe 30 years on how do humans recognize speech. And everybody who worked in the field of speech perception and speech recognition knew that human communication, if you just have speech alone, you don't see the lip movements, you don't see the person's face, all that stuff, you just hear the speech and you hear it in noise, zero dB S and R, minus 10 dB S and R. We knew that the error rate was on the order of 20%. This well documented. And so everybody assumed that the listener was making all the errors. Well, we did an experiment that took at least 10 years, and it's all published in various journals. And <clears throat> we did an experiment, and at first I tried to remove the bad samples. I, I'm not going to tell you the history behind it. What, what I discovered, which was, for me, was shocking. I have 30 listeners listening to all these sounds. And when there was an error, it turns out all the listeners had the same error. So that proved, beyond any questionable doubt in my mind, that the listeners weren't making the errors, the talkers were making the errors, and nobody anticipated. Everybody thought it was the listeners that were making the errors. And you mentioned 1% or 99%, correct? What I learned from this is that if you want to measure something like this, you have to do it on a logarithmic scale. You can't do probability correct. You have to do probability of error. And the error is unmeasurably small. You have to run a trial with 100,000 trials, and then you'll find out what the real error is. And right now, the error is dominated by the talker. And the the listeners don't have any error. I think it's a very interesting question. Can anybody uh, add something? Yeah, but very brief. Yeah, very brief. Uh, because uh, I just related the question before that how you train the robot to do the navigation. Uh, I cannot answer that, but I can point, I have a, a pointer to the place that's actually looking into that. Because um, the, I, I actually, one of the professor in UTS actually working on that problem because um, they, they ask the question that if we don't have we don't have any technology, we don't have a GPS and all that, but how can human beings still navigate very well? Right? And then they, they start looking into that and they see that there are some cell, you know, brain cell actually can re retain location and information for a certain amount of time. And then now they're doing experiment that with a person, very gifted person actually, that you know again you can have a quick look at what and then he you know closes the eye, you know, and then he remembers how to navigate, you know, and we actually do experiment with that person who, who is doing this day, you know, and then figure out the structure of the brain now in order to do that kind of navigation. So if you're interested in that, I can give you the name of the who did a lot of work in those areas. Okay. Thank you for the reference of Professor Dov. Any more questions, please? Yes. Yes, please uh, tell your name. Hi, Sharik. Uh, I'm from uh, 
density i am considering the vtech from mechanical branch and uh, actually i have two questions uh, first question is uh, that uh, ai is uh, gain ground uh, very much and uh, so that there is any device uh, which is able to uh, tra uh, travel uh, from one area to another area uh, uh, my uh, question is that uh, uh, daily problem is that uh, pollution and pollution main cause is uh, fuel and fuel is using in a uh, transport so transportation uh, that there is any device which is uh, uh, by the help of ai and uh, quantum technology we are able to make a device uh, which transport or teleport uh, a person uh, from one country to another or one place to another it's not uh, i mean once again the question is not it lacks clarity it doesn't make sense Like clarity, you know, because you mentioned something which I don't know any kind of mistake was wrong. Is there any more questions, please? Good evening, sir. My name is Ajit Shukla, and I am from MG IT Rapidly. My question to you is that while training the data, how can we improve the quality of data? Means in an image recognition software, I saw that about 99% it was correct, but 1% it was incorrect. So how AI can be useful in that case? Sure. Once again, you can let me take this question. My name is Ajit Shukla, and my question is that uh, while training the data, how can it be improved the quality of data? Means in an image recognition software, about 99% of the results were correct, one one percent were incorrect. So how can we improve that one percent of accuracy? So are you asking? So if I'm wrong about giving you an answer please say so and i'll just give up but this is a question it's a mathematical question you're given some data you're given n points of data it might be 10 points it might be a billion points and you also have another situation you're given n points of data it might be 10 or a billion and you want to know if those two sets of data are drawn from the same distribution so you've got to solve the problem of probability density estimation in very high dimensions where you're given observations and you want to put a noise floor on what those observations limit you to if if you solve that problem then i think you address this question it was it was very vague your question was very vague but i think you address that question with the right mathematics any more questions yes hello sir My name is Ashok Kumar. I am from Sierra Branch, Dr. Rajesh Kanpur. My question is, what about the future of data privacy? Because this ML deep learning and AI learning from us. So how the AI protect our data? What is that? So how AI protect our future data? Protect. Protect. How privacy protects our future data? So that's a very, I mean, it's a very interesting question. He asked that if you are using your data to train your models. You are asking about the AI and ML also learning from us. So, so I do not know if anybody can take this question once again. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, this is hard to answer. It is. Uh, <laughs> yeah. Yeah. We need. You need lawyers, professor. Uh, they say that professors cannot do it. Uh, you need lawyers to do this, right? Is that correct? Uh, Any more questions? Maybe, maybe we will take three more questions, and we need to respect time. Yeah. Okay. I am Dr. Anupam Kesri. Uh, my question is uh, like we always uh, heard like information is power. We always were listening this phrase. So uh, now one side development is occurring over building new algorithms, AI techniques, machine learning. so information calculation uh, aspect like process processing is also uh, going to be fast uh, another side development is occurring like uh, improvement in sensing technologies so both side data is uh, forming and better processing availability is available there so my question is like uh, in all the ways data availability and processing in future will improve so uh, are we moving in an era where uh, 
where machine will be stronger than than the human body because here there will be the competition between data and intelligence and we cannot uh, uh, avoid this thing okay so he is asking a very interesting can you take this question maybe anyone see i'll tell you something well let me before he answers you tell me uh, let's say you know which is the most intelligent robot in the world can anyone can anyone tell me yeah okay what is that yeah tell me a 3 year old kid And the Sophia, the most intelligent uh, uh, robot in the world. You think who is more intelligent? Let's say we have a four-year-old kid, four-year, or five-year. Let's say three-year-old kid, and the most intelligent robot, Sophia. Which is who is more intelligent? Huh? So that answers the question, I know. But anyway, we will have some interest from you guys. Uh, I mean, back to the comment about specific and general intelligence. I think if we have a specific task. We can always create a computer program that solves the problem better than a human. Correct. Even if there is uncertainty about the human, I mean, we talk about human recognition. What is the limitation of a human speech recognition? I think for all specific problems like that, says for all this, if we define the very narrow problem and we have a lot of data and processing power, we can solve the problem better. And it goes actually to even more complicated tasks uh, at this stage they say pilots in the airplane we can build software that flies the planes much better than the pilots and perhaps you know that i, I took a 14 hour flight the pilot is allowed to touch the controls for 7 minutes in the plane they are not allowed to touch the control <laughs> so if i have a specific task I can make a computer that is better than a human, but if you go to general intelligence, then we don't even can we cannot even formulate the equation that makes sense. So we are safe. Don't worry. The human beings still, you know, dominating the machines. So maybe we take one last question. We need to respect time. Maybe one last question. Hello and Thank good evening to everyone. My question. My name is Arun Singh, and my question is from Professor Roshi. When she was mentioning about uh, human-like AI, she mentioned that uh, we are trying to make an AI which can uh, idealize human behavior. So, if we are trying to make an AI which can idealize a human behavior, then why do we need that AI? And we are also limited by storage capacity. And we have to learn, we have to uh, develop or design a lengthy algorithm to uh, understand human behavior. So, is it really possible? To make an AI which can uh, truly understand the human behavior. Is the question clear to you, Rose? Oh, great. It's it's. <laughs> we we can talk a lot about uh, this problem. It's a uh, philosophical uh, question. Um, I'll give you an example, which actually, um, uh, Zina, you you talked about. Um, Uh, just now about specific algorithms for specific questions. Um, I'm, I'm going to give you an example from a project I just finished with UK's Intellectual Property Office. So they asked us to um, train and test different AI algorithms to see which one can perform best the task of prior art patent examination. So this is a process where examiners have to go through a very, very large body of existing patents and find similar patents to uh, an application. So the expectation was that we are going to test, I don't know how many, 20, 25, 30 state-of-the-art algorithms and will tell them this is the most accurate or this is the fastest. And we were very, very skeptical from day one about this approach because the task of a patent examiner is not just information retrieval, they're not, you know, using 
algorithms just to to find. You know, it's not as simple as that. Actually, the most knowledge-intensive job in the world I know is the job of that patent examiner. So what they need to do is they need to read the patent application and they have to, to understand where the novelty is. They almost have to decipher what's written in the patent because sometimes the applicants use language just to make the application <coughs> unique. Um, so, so in fact, they have to compose something they call search statements, okay? Um, and then the algorithms can, can do their job and they can find the closest item. So that was easy, okay? So we said, I said, okay, you just give us access to your search statements and we are indeed going to run 25 algorithms and we'll tell you the answer. Uh, but they said, no, 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 we can't give you the search statements. This is um, privacy. So, for example, the patent examiners in the office, they don't want to give their consent. They record everything. They record the search history, you know, for previous applications. So, so if we had that search history, we could easily go back in time and, and then assess like all the prediction algorithms, uh, the way it is. Um, so they said, no, 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 we can't give you the search statement. We said, okay, but you are missing an opportunity here. Okay. So we, we run, uh, not, uh, we, we identified the best algorithms for several, five or six different steps involved in that examination process. So, for example, for classification, there are different algorithms which can be used for, then for uh, um, similarity assessment, another family of algorithms, etc., etc. So, going back to your question about how AI replacing people and this philosophical question, no, we don't want to replace people, we want them to um, to, to do the actual, intellectual part of the exercise. We still want them to make sense of the application, formulate that search statement, uh, understand uh, where the novelty is, and then of course AI can help uh, to, to classify, to cluster, uh, to find similarity, find the closest drawings, you know, in the sketches. So all these things which you said some some tasks are really easy for the algorithms. They can do very, very easy. And there will be that component which only the human mind can do at the moment. And we need to keep that. And this is what we need to work collectively. We need to allow machines to help us, okay? And we need to, to understand how to design a world where uh, people and machines basically can work together. But we need to redesign workplaces, workspaces, tasks. So this is a big problem which um, I'm sure will be addressed. Progress. This, uh, we'll, we'll spend the next few years thinking about these things and uh, reassessing our world, uh, really, the way it is organized now. I was just thinking if we can solve the patent examiner problem, we'll be able to solve the paper review problem and then professor will have a very easy life after that. Good evening, everyone. No, I think we are done. You have a question? Yes, sir. But I declared that was the last question. Okay, so we come to uh, close to the panel discussion. So once again, we would like to thank the panelists. Can we have a round of applause for the panelists? And uh, my, uh, my final remarks from this would be, you see, uh, we can't live 
you know, there is a little bit of computing in everybody's life. We just can't live without computing. So, good, bad, you know, negative thing, positive thing, you know, changing the society, bringing something bad, something good. We have to all live with this, but of course, computing is always forever. With that, we come to an end to the panel discussion. Once again, I thank all of you for joining me. Thank you all once again, and also thank you all the attendees who have taken interest in this panel discussion. Thank you so much. So, Professor Allen has been quite popular, you know, he has been, people have been asking and he has been answering most of the questions. So, thank you, Professor John, once again.